After the civil war, our first aim was to rebuild what had been lost. Nowhere was this more necessary than in the province of Galicia. And so we traveled there, together, to right the wrongs of the recent past. In today's episode, we will take a look at the creation of Star of the Poles, the second scenario of the Adviga campaign. We will also continue our overview of how you can create your own scenarios, and how you go from a rough idea to a first draft. Welcome to Making Jadwiga. Designing a campaign, let alone a single scenario, is a big project. To succeed, you're going to have to plan your steps before you take them. By now you know who you want your campaign to center around, and the next step is to gather as much information as possible about that person. In other words, it's time for research. Some people might cringe at this, but Wikipedia is usually a good starting point. It will often give you a good overview, if you're basing your campaign on a historical person. So look for anything that could be turned into a scenario, a gameplay mechanic, a plot point, or even a side quest or line of dialogue. Then, if you want to dive deeper, you can search out the books and articles mentioned in the footnotes, and from these you can construct a more detailed and nuanced picture of your character. All of this is pretty straightforward if you're basing your campaign on historical events, but if you're doing historical fiction or fantasy, you may want to research different topics. We'll start with historical fiction. Let's say you want to tell a story about two Viking brothers who are separated at birth. One embarks on an expedition to the remote lands of Vinland, and the other becomes a celebrated soldier in the Byzantine empires of Varangia and Gard. In the final scenario, their paths cross, as they end up on opposing sides at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. Even if the core story and characters here are fictional, it's still pretty easy to see what you should be researching to make it believable. Now, you should probably not try to do this exact story, as it already exists. This is the story of Lightning and Thunder by Oliver, an abandoned mega campaign from 2006, which is a real treat if you can get a hold of it. What you can do, however, is map out the major settings and plot points in this way, and then do a deeper dive into the things that will feature most prominently in your story. But let's say you're not interested in history at all. Let's say you want to tell a fantasy story. For this, you may not have to research historical battles or how it was like to live in the Middle Ages, but doing so can definitely make your fantasy world more realistic. If you're creating a fantasy story from scratch, you also need to define exactly what kind of story it's going to be. Do you want it to have magic and several sentient races, like in The Lord of the Rings? Or do you want something closer to reality, without orcs and dragons? What's the climate and geography of your world? And what is the political situation? Is the world split into feudal kingdoms, modern nation-states, or is most of the known world ruled by a single empire like in Roman times? And so on. Asking yourself questions like this will help you discover what you want to research. Make sure to keep your ambitions focused though. If your story takes place in a single region or two, you do not have to describe the entire fantasy planet before getting to work. Although, if you're planning on expanding your story at a later stage, it might still be a good idea to have at least a rough concept of what the rest of your world looks like. Also, if you're going all out with dragons and orcs and stuff, you should probably start researching how to make your own mods, or scour the DE download section, the Steam Workshop and Age of Kings 7 Blacksmith for mods made by other people. If you do use other people's mods, always make sure to give due credit. Most models are happy to see their work being put to use, but crediting the person who did the actual legwork is just common decency. At this stage in the making of the Jadwiga campaign, we only knew that we wanted Jadwiga to be the protagonist, and for Jogaila and Vitaudas to play prominent roles. We didn't yet know exactly how the story would play out, but after a few weeks of research we had a pretty good idea about which parts of the story to include. And we knew that we just had to work the Battle of Grunwald in there somehow, even though it took place more than a decade after her death. Once we had this initial mess of notes and bullet points, it was time to organize them into a coherent plan. The first draft is where we take this sprawling web of characters and plot points and whittle it down into something that fits in a campaign format. For the Jadwiga campaign, that meant cutting things down until I had a very rough outline for six scenarios, each with specific goals and gameplay ideas, and a narrative that tied them all together. In practice, this turned into a simple text document where I listed all the major events that were to take place in each scenario, 
to make sure the story wouldn't require 10,000 words of voiceover or 10 or more scenarios, I had to drop several interesting plot threads during this process. Among these was the extended story of William of Habsburg, Jadwiga's love interest in the first scenario. After being separated from Jadwiga, he refused to marry anyone else until after her death, and he tried and failed to convince the Teutonic Order to invade Poland and dethrone Jogaila. There was also a potential scenario involving the Duke of Apol, who rebelled against Jogaila a few years into his reign, and another about the succession crisis in Hungary. All of this would have been interesting to include, but when you're making a campaign in the Ensemble Studio style with five or six action-oriented scenarios and a very compressed story, you simply don't have room to include everything. That's partially because a lot of players do want a very short story so they can start playing faster, and partially for budget reasons. Voice actors are expensive, and for official campaigns every line you write will need to be dubbed into multiple languages, which means hiring multiple sets of voice actors in many different countries. That is why all the slideshows in Jadwiga amount to only about 2400 words. Even when you add all the in-game dialogue, a lot of which is purely instructional, that number only rises to about 5500 words. To put it another way, the entire story and all the dialogue in this campaign would fit into a single chapter of a book like Game of Thrones, so you don't really have the luxury of detailed character arcs or complicated plots. When you're making a custom campaign, there are no such limitations. You can create a far more extensive story with many more and more detailed scenarios and give more depth both to the characters and the world itself. But even then, it's always a good idea to keep the story as efficient as possible. Make sure your prose has punch and that your dialogues don't linger. After all, even in a story-focused campaign, people are still going to want to play the scenarios. The starting point for the map design in Star of the Poles was that I really wanted to do an autumn-themed map. Full autumn maps are very rare, and the only example I can think of is an old custom scenario called Project Autumn by Gaspar, which was never finished. Before the definitive edition, your options for autumn maps were extremely limited, because there was precisely one brown terrain in the entire game, and perhaps three others fit for the job. In DE you have a lot more options, including the new terrain layering tool, as well as different color modes which help improve the atmosphere. The main set piece of this scenario is the town of Harlech, which is your main enemy. It was the first thing I designed, as I already had an image of this copper tone city in my head which I wanted to create. There are three neutral towns on the map, all of which are completely passive and used only for the side quests. I wanted each of them to have something of a personality, so one became a farming town, another a lumber town, and the last one a trade hub. And the first one I designed was the farming town of Pohonich. I think that's how it's pronounced at least. Mm -hmm. 
I moved back and forth across the map a lot, but the next main stop was the half-ruined town of Lviv, near the player's base, which is one of the main side quest givers. And yes, apologies if I mispronounced these names, I do not speak Polish, like, at all. <laughs> The most annoying thing here were the walls for the first side quest, and how to make them connect properly when the player rebuilt them. If the walls just belonged to the Lviv player, they wouldn't connect, and if you change the ownership to the player, the same thing happens. So it didn't look very good. Instead I had to instantly remove and recreate the walls with triggers, and make sure they are created as play 1 buildings. It's not something you might think about when you're actually plaguing the scenario, but it's one of those small things that you spend a surprising amount of time just figuring out and getting it perfect. After this I designed the Lithuanian village. Initially they seem like just another neutral player, but if you complete the pagan conversion objective, you'll notice that they turn quite angry. Which is probably because you deleted most of their villagers right after converting them. Next up was the neutral town of Roatin in the center of the map. A sleepy lumber town where the trees never fall, no matter how long you chop them. I did this by changing the work rate of the lumberjacks to zero. This helps to bring some life to the town, while also making sure they don't gather all the wood the player might need. The last major design point was the player's base. When you have a pretty standard build and destroy start, like in this scenario, I usually leave this until near the end, since you don't really have to create a very intricate design. The most important thing when designing a build and destroy base is to make sure it looks somewhat attractive, while making sure it's easy to navigate and close to all necessary resources. You don't want it to look like a random map start, but it should still be as practical as a random map start, essentially. Lastly, I filled in all the gaps I'd left earlier, mostly with brown autumn forests and dead grasslands, to tie the design together. As opposed to the matter of the crown, the final version of this scenario resembles the original script I wrote pretty closely, except I had to cut some of the original dialogue. At first I had the idea that you would need to tribute resources to the neutral towns you took over, to make sure they stayed on your side. But with the gameplay already having quite a few unique mechanics, it made more sense to skip this and streamline the town control mechanic into what it is now. Another thing I ended up cutting was a seemingly insignificant side quest where you would donate money to a village ravaged by the war. Not for any reward, but simply to showcase that Vega's regard for the common people. In custom scenarios you don't have to consider stuff like the company's budget for voiceover lines, so if you can find little things like this and turn them into gameplay, that can really help with immersion. Star of the Poles combines classic build and destroy gameplay with some unique mechanics, and out of the six in the campaign this one required the most testing and balancing before it felt just right. Next time we will dive into Duel of the Dukes, a Risk style scenario depicting the civil war between Yogagala and his ambitious cousin Vitaurus.